I came across Saint Sister when I was um, watching NPR Tiny Desk, actually. Um, oh. and, and I was mesmerized by your performance. I thought it was amazing. And so that led me to do a bit more research. Um, but yeah, I mean, first of all, how was it to appear on that, on that series? And, um, you know, were, were you a fan of that series before going on? Yeah, yeah big time. it was a real dream one. Like um, when we, we, I think we had met or Bob Boylan had come to our show at South by maybe um, a couple of years back. And yeah, it was just one of those moments where when he kind of mentioned that we should come on the show, we were just like, oh my God, we need to make this happen. Like, will this actually happen? And then, yeah, when it did, it really was just like incredible. I've just seen that backdrop so many times and it was a pretty frightening experience to actually be in there. <laughs> yeah. But it was great, yeah. Um, and and so what what performances of Tiny Desk had, had you seen before that? Like, were you, um, were you guys really, um, were you really into the series? Because I, I watch it all the time, like particularly in lockdown. I don't know whether you guys have seen like some of the lockdown ones, but they've been really good at, at kind of you know, yeah. keeping things uplifted. I think it's just amazing what they do in particular, which um, kind of daunted us and was scary to us was, you know, obviously they, they basically don't, they have limited um, microphones and kind of uh, sound equipment. Everything sounds great still, but there's no, you can't hide behind any reverb and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. we were really uh, kind of afraid of that. And I remember Bob saying, and, and I've loved that when I've listened to other people's, like one that comes to mind is uh, Phoebe Bridgers when she did the, she did one with Connor Oberst and she's been in loads of times with Boy Genius and on her own. I love when she, um, love her ones. But her voice, it like still cuts through and it's still so good, but so bare. And Bob actually said he kind of enjoys um, like almost testing musicians and like that it's a bit of a challenge. Yeah. And he says everyone comes in and they're like, can we just, can we try and can I use my mic and put it in? But he's like, no, this is the test. Like this is yeah. you're supposed to be uncomfortable here and we're supposed to be able to hear your voices in a different way, which is... Pushes which, you to your limit a bit. Yeah, yeah it's, it's... In a great way. Such a cool idea. Yeah. What are your favorite ones? Well, I, I, from that perspective, um, like I've I've seen so many of them. Like, I mean, Anderson Pack was wicked. I thought, like, yeah, they're like even playing drums and stuff in that tiny little space. Just even keeping it down and keeping yeah. it groovy was like quite difficult. But I, I really liked. Um, it was a weird one because I'm not a big fan of his music per se. I quite like it. it's catchy, but um, and it's good pop and R and B. But T Pain went on it right he his stuff is normally super auto-tuned and like it's kind of very much that style mm -hmm. a bit like chris brown and that, that stuff which i do like but it's very particular and there are definitely some music snobs out there who'd be like no that's just auto-tuned that's not very yeah. good and so probably and well actually t-pain himself said at the start of the tiny desk like but you guys are wondering what's going to happen without the auto <laughs> <laughs> and, like, yeah. that, and he was <laughs> He had the most like incredible voice that I've ever heard. It was like that's unbelievable, amazing. so soulful and just incredible. Um, that's, that, that's why I, I, I love the series. And, and they celebrate, you know, people from, from everywhere uh, yeah. and, uh, you know, all, all different stages of their career. And yeah, yeah. I mean, what a wonderful show. And I mean, in terms of podcasting and like having chats with uh, musicians or even like people who are just fans of music and want to, um, tell me a bit about like their favorite records. That's kind of what this podcast in spirit is meant to be about as well. Um, so right. yeah, what, one of my questions, um, well, um, would be um, for my listeners who haven't heard Saint Sister and you know aren't familiar with your music, how how would you guys describe it? I know that can be quite difficult. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, how would we describe it? Well, first of all, we're two women from Ireland and um, we are yeah we work as a duo like a songwriting and arrangement production duo I guess so Morgan is the songwriter and I'm Gemma I focus a bit more on the musical side of things um, we've been making music for maybe five six years um, our first record is out our second record is finished but not out um, you notice I'm really skirting around having to put like a genre on this or having to describe it. But uh, basically, we, I guess our main kind of, our main focus um, in the recorded music and in the live shows is we 
we sing together, we sing a lot in unison. Um, a lot of, I guess, like drawing on a lot of folk music, maybe a lot of folk melody. Um, we sing a lot in unison, we sing a lot in two-part harmony. And we also, I am a harpist, so there's a heavy um, influence of harp music on the band as well. So we dive into um, electronics on stage as well. So there's a bit of a crossover there. But I guess at the core of our kind of what we're about is our our vocals and the harp, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, you, so you guys, that I mean, the harmonies and the, and the singing, uh, and it, it sounds so, um, I don't know, just kind of soulful and uh, I don't know. It sounded a little. It sounds a little bit like dr dramatic. I don't know. It sounds like meaningful music to me. Um, and you guys have had some amazing experiences playing live. Um, you know, you touring touring with Keen and and opening for Robbie Williams and. And playing for Macron in France is that is that all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, how how did those things come about? What amazing what an amazing ride you guys have had so far. I mean, I'm not surprised because because uh, Shape of Silence is such a great record. But you. Um, you know, um, how how did these things come about um, from from your guys' inception to to now? Well, I think at the start of um, the band's career, we kind of spent a lot of time playing and um, probably when we should have taken some time out to write. So we were just, we said yes to every single gig and um, from that opportunities came and we we kind of took a long time on the recorded side of things. And I think at the, at, during the time we were, weren't sure whether that was the right decision, but we just, just kind of felt right to keep saying yes to things. And, and that very fortunately led to some lovely gigs that maybe we felt a bit of out of our depth and that we didn't have any right to get given that we were still kind of a small band in terms of our recorded output but then um I guess it really those gigs and and kind of having to step up a few notches um every once in a while really informed our uh, recorded side of things so and how we write so I'm glad that that's how it came about and it did take us a little bit longer than we probably thought we it would take for us to get the first album out but it wouldn't have been the same album if we'd rushed it out for, first and we wouldn't have had the benefit of all those um brilliant gigs and and those kind of experiences and experiences together because we it was not only were they fun to play but also just the journey there together spending so much time on the road together was really informative and in particular now for our second record has really really helped that so um yeah, we were, we were very lucky early on to work with um, our agent, Alex, um, and he is just the star, so great and so kind. And um, we we benefited a lot from him kind of seeing something in us. So, yeah. And and do you, do you remember your first gig? Uh, where, where did you play your first gig as Saint Sister? Yes, it was in, it was a night in college, wasn't it? Yeah. Or it was in the in the chocolate factory, yeah, in yeah. the little cafe, come the bed space in in Dublin, um, and it was very rusty. We only played three songs. I think it was like a, <laughs> a variety kind of a night. And actually, yeah. recently we um, saw that a friend of ours who we worked with since and who just designed some tote bags for us was doing spoken word that night, and I don't think we, we knew didn't know her. Yeah, time, but we were just looking back through photos, and Gemma came across. And I was so like, "That's her." that's our drummer's kit in the background and like that's all of our stuff like really early our really early setup it's the first gig we ever played I think it was so awkward oh yeah. I'd say it was like really the kind of gig we were like oh god I would not like to hear that right now but you have to start somewhere I suppose yeah. um, and then after that gig we got offered a run of small shows with a friend friend sorry a small run of shows um in like Irish venues with uh friends of ours a band called Spies and as Morgan said I think we had three songs that night and we got offered these gigs and we were like do we take them like I think I think we played five songs in that support slot or something but we were just like it's worth it <laughs> like really probably everyone if we'd asked them would have said you're not ready for this but we just kind of jumped in and I think we just learned so much through those like kind of just like jumping at those early opportunities and you're kind of you can make a lot of mistakes then because the stakes are lower. You're not, we had just started as a band. Um, 
and there was no music out there. We changed our name and everything in the interim. So there was just like a lot of time for figuring things out, I think. Yeah, well, that probably helped you guys do things like sing in harmony together. And yeah, fewer and fewer people, um, it seems in, in at least in like the kind of center stage of pop culture, doing things like singing in, in, in harmony, particularly live, like, there's, yeah. there's so much help from from tech and, and it's kind of necessary because people have camera phones and film mistakes and it the, the stakes are higher. Uh, yeah. but so when you played your first gig, um, had you been rehearsing loads? Like what what was the what was the kind of you know, were you super ambitious? Did did you envisage all this success that you've had or or did you just kind of want to get involved in, in the variety night? We we definitely did have like ambitions for the band I just don't think we quite knew what they were yet so um I think the sound it sonically was maybe a bit confused <laughs> uh there was a lot going on we were just kind of you know they were the songs were there they were I think at that point maybe songs Morgan that you had written beforehand and we were playing with a drummer and a bass player and we were all just kind of just jamming them out a bit more and feeling them out a bit more um but again through that just like getting up and doing that on stage a few times we started to kind of you ease into it and then you feed off what maybe people are enjoying and what makes you feel good on stage. And uh, yeah, we did, like we spent a lot of time in like the rehearsal room more at the beginning. Whereas now maybe more of our sonic ideas would come from like messing around in the studio and then working backwards and turning them into a live performance. Mm -hmm. At the start, we were like, it was more of a, more of a jam and it was really fun and I think yeah we we kind of figured out maybe what we shouldn't do <laughs> and then that le like veered us more towards what we what we should do and how did you guys meet well yeah we were like strangers kind of when we started the band and that we didn't really know each other at all and um, we had met and I think that's why probably it took us a little while to figure out what exactly we wanted and, and what the band should sound like but um we met in we went to the same university and uh kind of knew of each other and um kept crossing each other's paths and uh then in our i think at one point we played against each other in a battle of the bands but mm -hmm. was, um one i just remember seeing a harp in the corner and being like oh god they brought up <laughs> oh my god how am i gonna beat that um but then years later we were performing in our college orchestra does like a cover gigs thing where they um kind of put on these big shows with the orchestra and, and we did uh the gorillas album demon days and we were in the choir section of it and i didn't know anyone at all and Gemma had been in it for a little while so she kind of knew more people and was kind of part of the gang and i was kind of sat on my own the first day of rehearsals um knitting a hat trying to look as if I didn't care that I didn't know anyone and uh, she very kindly came over with her friends and was like talking to me and um, invited me in so to speak but I remember hearing her voice I knew she played the harp and I knew she was um, someone I I would love to have chatted about um, music with but when I heard her sing I was thinking okay this is she's um she's a content like she's she's my competition here I need to um, I need to step up my game and then I quickly had the idea instead of thinking of it that way maybe I'll bring her <laughs> onto my team and uh and um I basically just reached out I have no no basis but I just was looking for someone to work with and asked her whether she'd like to meet for coffee and she said yes thank god <laughs> wow that's that, that's awesome um and and so w when you guys um when 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 did you decide to call yourself saint sister because you mentioned you changed the name we started off as um, O Sister, so just like O, um, O Sister, and then we there was a bit of confusion really early on with another band in London with like a very similar name, different spelling, but uh, even like those really early gigs we were talking about, um, we were kind of getting tagged in the wrong things on Facebook, and we had so few followers or anything, it didn't really matter at that point, but just remember thinking that it would um it would run into problems like later on we played a gig really soon after those gigs we were so fortunate to get a gig with uh supporting will butler from arcade fire i don't know how that happened 
it was like our fifth gig or something. Again, we probably had about five songs and it was terrifying. But afterwards in the dressing room, he was like, oh, I, I checked you guys out. And it turned out he'd been listening to the other band um, after the gigs had been booked or whatever. And we were like, okay, this is going to pose some problems. So I think ra- rather than getting into this thing online, we, we had been in touch with them and they, she was a really lovely person. And we just kind of decided if we're going to go for this, we shouldn't have a name that's going to like, we hadn't put any music out yet. So we were like, it's very easy to change it at this point. You know, yeah. there's nothing online to have to change. Of course, at that stage, we'd maybe played about six gigs and we thought this was the worst thing ever, but like, the stakes were very low. Um, yeah. But then it, it's hard, like we've, it's difficult to come up with a band name, especially when the band doesn't really, you don't really know what you are yet. So it was just a lot of, uh, yeah, brainstorming terrible ideas. And um, eventually this, we kind of liked the, alliteration of the Saint Sister and also the kind of kind of drew out a bit more strength in that like that relationship or that dynamic you can have with like one other person or one other woman um this sort of like the yeah we we just we liked those that what that combination kind of meant and yeah that was kind of it then yeah I mean it, it's a great name I'm almost surprised that the name hadn't been taken before uh that's, <laughs> that must have been quite a mix it must have felt quite like annoying or like i don't know it must have been a bit uneasy when when he'd been listening to the other the other guys music but but definitely a great a great decision and a great way of responding to it yeah. i mean a little bit like this podcast i'm a bit surprised that no one had thought of greatest music of all time really i know <laughs> But um, I guess with these like names and the internet and the way things that work now, it's like you've got to grab your name while you can. Yeah, like, that's it. Otherwise, for the rest of you know humankind, like you know, there's only room for one saint sister. There's only you know, there's only room for yeah. for, for one of everything really, because otherwise it's just super confusing with Google and all, all the rest of it. Um, yeah. So you guys um, seem to draw on a lot of different um, influences, and given the nature of this podcast, it would be great to hear like who 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 are each of your favorite bands and artists and um inspirations um you know growing up and 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 who are you listening to right now mm. um i l- grew up listening to um kind of s- the singer songwriter storyteller kind of people um loved bob dylan leonard cohen um I like the country kind of stuff, Patty Klein. And then in my late teens, discovered Joni Mitchell and just completely fell in love and just thought this is where the book stops. She's just um, the, the best, the greatest artist, greatest music of all time, I think comes from Joni Mitchell. Um, so that is, and, and I continue to be inspired by her. I still stick, I'm, ne- I'm probably never gonna get tired of um, Blue in particular, that album. So there's just so much to it. Um, so I grew up, kind of been inspired by her but she still inspires me but more recently there's a lot of amazing things happening in Ireland um Rachel Lavelle is an amazing up-and-coming singer-songwriter and she's every time I hear her play live she's only got one song I think out at the moment but every time I hear her play live I'm thinking like some of the songs that she's written are like they are Joni Mitchell-esque they could I think they could nearly sit on a par like she's writing out of her skin so um, I really recommend she unfortunately she only does have one song out but it's um, if you can if you have the time to look her up you, you'd, you'd really like her and um, I think she's going to be big soon um, but myself and Gemma kind of have different inspirations I think which kind of maybe adds to the sound of Saint Sister and that we're coming from different places. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I kind of grew up with more of a, a traditional Irish background and like education, but then also um, as a classical player. So, um, yeah, a lot of my influences, maybe it's so hard to know where things come from, but the things that I can directly point to as like sort of moments that I that were really important, I think would be um there's a Scottish harper called Katrina Mackay and she's just incredible the things that she does with the instrument and the instrument alone it's it's purely acoustic and it's not uh the she you 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 might listen to a recording of hers and think that there are like two or three takes or two or three harpists but like 
it's like she has six hands on the thing and she can just make it sound a way that I hadn't really heard anyone make it before. Um, I started listening to her maybe in my teens and I can't play anything like her, but um, just that notion of like using an instrument in, she really pushes, She her music is is kind of traditional in in nature, but it's very contemporary in the way that she, she's a composer as well. Um, and in her, just her performance is, just takes it to this whole new place. So that was a real moment for me of like the harp as being, it can be something other than what I had, the associations that I had with it before. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of like the minimalists music as well, I think would have a influence on my like composition, like composers like Steve Reich and Phil Glass. Um, I think my like music meets somewhere in between <laughs> those those kinds of um those kinds of places well yeah i mean so, some of the, some of these um things i need to check out but uh also some i can kind of see that they've had a had a big influence uh, yeah. sure. and so for my listeners who aren't familiar um with shape of silence or with you know um your tunes yet um is there one song that you suggest that they start with Ooh, that's a difficult one. Mm. We'd probably have different songs as well, I think. I think that's it, because we do have um, on the one album kind of, and it's the same can be said for the next album that we're, we've just finished, kind of the extremes of some of our songs can be very stripped back or just a cappella, like kind of a folk melody, and then some of them are kind of electronic-y and almost two different worlds, but hopefully they live mm. well side by side. But we can maybe pick one each and that yeah. probably will also represent the two different worlds but i would say um maybe the matter which is the closer to ship of silence and um for me it's like kind of the most indulgent lyrically and uh, it just feels like i'm really yeah like kind of um twisting into some sort of uh meaning or like really leaning into um kind of expressing myself in a specific way that felt really good at the time and kind of still feels good to sing um because some songs become less less mm. uh, fresh when you sing them and you care less about them every time you sing them but that that one still kind of holds true to me and I, lo I love singing it I love the way Gemma plays the harp on it nice um mine from the first record would probably be causing trouble which um yeah is one of the not one of the earlier ones that we wrote on that album, but it it's it was early enough, and I feel like it was when we were kind of pushing through that song. Felt like we were getting into some sort of understanding of like our new way of writing, and I think something clicked on writing that song that doesn't happen on every song. And I feel the same about, um, although it's an older tune, I don't feel like it's old when I play it, which is always a nice feeling. <laughs> so. So that so those tunes are, are what people are going to check out if they haven't heard your music yet. Um, although I'm sure some of my listeners will will have, uh, partic particularly after that tiny desk performance, which was just unbelievable. Oh, um, thank you so much. But, uh, so normally, I finish by asking people who their favourite artist of all time is. But you guys have kind of already answered that um, with my earlier question. So yeah. I'm going to have a different different final question today, which is. Can you name me one thing that you guys uh, like or have found okay or relatively uplifting about coronavirus and like the whole situation and the thing that you like the least about it? Good question. Let's start with the least so that we can end on an uplifting positive note. <laughs> okay. So the thing I like least about the coronavirus, um, apart from all the obvious terrible things that are happening kind of the deaths and the um, suffering that people are going through um which is kind of obvious but on a very personal level um i really miss being able to just sing out loud and like kind of uh the value of singing and the kind of therapeutic communal happiness that you can get when you when you're singing on, on kind of uninterrupted and without any restrictions or feeling that you're kind of being too loud or and even just singing with someone, there's such a such an amazing thing that you forget um, 
like kind of a endorphin that you get when you're kind of singing with someone. So um, I live in a tiny flat in Dublin. Um, I'm recording this from my bedroom. There's like no space at all. And if I tried to sing out loud, um, my neighbours would be like banging the broomsticks on the on the mm-hmm. floor ceiling. So that we recorded something the other day and we were just singing, we're just rehearsing. And ordinarily that wouldn't even wouldn't even cross my mind what we were doing because we're just kind of warming up but it just felt so nice it was such a Mm. such a relief um yeah so that's probably my least favorite thing not being able to to play with Gemma what's your favorite thing oh I was gonna wait (laughs) um my favorite thing is I've just been able to take a bit of a a pause and stay in the one place for a while and I'm a bit of a body anyway so I love touring and there's such a it's so amazing but it is also really exhausting and um and i love the good things about touring are amazing but the bad things are kind of bad (laughs) they're they're maybe a little bit worse so being able to stay in the same spot for a while and just it's been quite good for my head i think and um and also being able to spend loads of time with family and things like that so it's been quite restorative for me yeah and jenna yeah i think again aside from you know, there are so many ways that you could go with the, the bad parts of this um, period of time or this year. But just on a personal level, as musicians, I think it's really, it's tough to kind of see like the, the industry in just like such a state of turmoil and that's all your friends and everyone you'd, you've worked with and us ourselves. And I think that's been a real gradual realization of like how big of an impact that is having. Um, it's obviously just quite hard to kind of take on, but uh, and yeah, the the loss of shows and the kind of just loss of what this year was supposed to be for everyone, and that's affected it's affected everyone, but um, it's just affected so many people in so many different ways. Um, but then the other side of that is just Morgan, as you were saying, like time to kind of reflect a bit more, and I think we've just been on like a bit of a treadmill with like what we were doing and there there isn't isn't much time for pause and kind of just thinking like well what could we kind of do differently can we can we make anything out of this break and I think more recently we've been doing that just um delving into like ourselves and what we're doing personally and what what our um where we want to go with the band on like a kind of a bigger scale as opposed to just going recording to recording and and gig to gig um so yeah, I've, this is the this is the tough time, and it will get better. And hopefully, people have just had a bit of time for a pause and maybe a bit of a yeah, just like a, a re rethink. And we'll all come out with not exactly what we'd planned going into, it, but um, something newer and something exciting anyway. Yeah, well, fingers crossed. I hope I hope you guys are able to start performing as as soon as possible. Um, you know, as I say, as I say to pretty much everybody, because it's a difficult time yeah. for music. But thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It was a pleasure to meet you both, and uh, yeah, I wish you all the best going forward um, for your career, and, and look, looking forward to your second album. Thanks so much, Tom. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye. Thanks, a million. Bye. Bye.